All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's talk on queer authenticity in the history of games. Uh, this is actually already our fourth event in our series Game City Impulse, where we at Game City Hamburg put our focus on topics of diversity and equality in the games industry and also in game communities. If you haven't seen the first three events yet, uh, just head over to the Game City Hamburg YouTube channel if you're not already there right now, and you'll find a playlist of all our Impulse events. Uh, just a few very quick words about who we are. Game City Hamburg is the location initiative for the games industry here in the lovely city of Hamburg, Germany. And our mission is to support and connect the people and the many people who work with games here in town and also beyond. But more importantly for today, our speaker for today is Lara Keilbart. She's a freelance journalist, a podcaster and speaker with a focus on queerness and diversity, among others. And we are very happy that today Today, she'll give us some insights on her research about queer authenticity in the history of games, as the title says. So without further ado, welcome, Lara. Oh, um, we can't hear you right now. I don't know why. Ah, yes. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Now uh, you should hear me. Uh, I muted myself uh, because there was some uh, loud emergency traffic outside. Um, yeah, nice uh, to see you all or meet you all. Uh, thanks for joining uh, despite the really warm summer weather. Um, I hope you have, get something out of this talk and um, I will now um, give, uh, like, let me quickly switch on my presentation for you and then we can get started. Um, a second here we go now you should see the presentation and we can dive into my talk okay welcome to queer authenticity in the history of games um i've done some research for um, a book um, I will uh, show you the book at the end of the talk, which deals with history, portrayal of history and uh, everything that's connected to history in video games as a whole. And I um, participated by writing about queer authenticity. Um, of course, it's just a, a small fraction of that um, essay I wrote. So if you're interested afterwards, um, you can just uh, read the book, which is hopefully available in the library next to you. So uh, before I get started, or like at the start, I want to briefly um, highlight the um, thing that makes this talk a bit uh, recent because um, not long ago, uh, the big com video game company Blizzard released um, a blog post um, showing off um, a so-called diversity tool. And this diversity tool uh, had some uh, like various markers and you could um, switch around some things. And here we have the example of one of the Overwatch characters uh, and how they scored on the diversity uh, scale. Um, and this is of course a bit weird because um, queerness cannot be um, portrayed by numbers. Uh, and so uh, we will see later that how problematic that might be. And, and I think it's, um, it's important for my talk because of course I also try to somehow measure queerness um, in terms of their authenticity, but I will try to do it differently, not by a, um, like scales or numbers, but on a more um, deeper level. Uh, but looking at this page, it's quite interesting that uh, this kind of character, Anna, gets a seven for being Egyptian, uh, but uh, what country is considered most diverse at 10? How does that, who, who decides that? What sexual orientation is considered a 10? Um, that is so far from the proposed norm because that's zero on the scale. And if a cisgender woman is uh, a five, uh, what's a transgender woman? What's a non-binary person? So hopefully my approach will be a bit different. Um, that's for you to decide. I'm happy to discuss this afterwards, uh, but I want to make this clear. I don't claim that my research method is the best or the only one or even a correct one. That's open for discussion. It's just something that I would like to put out in the world. And uh, hopefully it's uh, of some use for you and others. So um, 
in the history of games, uh, video games, um, we have a, an ongoing process. And, and um, at the moment, we have some slow positive progress in certain areas uh, in the media as a whole, like film and TV. But other sections, like video games, are still lacking behind. Um, you can see that in the um, annual report uh, of uh, the Media Institute called GLAD. Um, their annual report always is called Where Are We Now? And they focus a lot on TV um, and streaming, but they also include sometimes uh, games. Um, video games are even more important than TV and, and streaming and movies right now because they're quickly taking over as the most consumed medium. <coughs> And um, thus, uh, is video games are the most influ influential uh, medium right now because more and more people are playing it, and um, even more people are playing video games than watching um, movies or going uh, or watching like TV shows. Um, video games are also a, a social artifact, and as such, have to be scrutinized from a cultural angle and not only from an economical one. Because of course, video games are super. Um, successful on an economic scale, like uh, big video game companies make millions and billions of money, money each year. But um, it's more important to look um, at video games, who is creating the games, what's the content, what's their impact. And that is what cultural studies does. Um, video games and the representation of people in it impact the culture, cultural corpus of those who interact with them which basically just means that if I play video games, it has a certain uh, amount of impact on me. How big that impact is and what kind of impact that is, that's of course uh, very individual, but um, it's undeniable that it has an impact. Um, and through representation, people can better understand the world around them and themselves, which means if uh, I, this is one way of an impact, if I play a certain game about a certain, I don't know, country or a certain kind of, person, then it might help me understand that country, that person, or a situation or a topic better. Um, that said, queerness in mainstream games has been mostly missing in the past uh, and still remains a rarity with uh, some notable exceptions. But um, in this talk, I will focus on the past, not so much on the present, but I will get there at the end. Um, so uh, hang in there. Um, it does that queerness as a rarity in video games does not mean that queerness has been totally absent in video games uh, or in video game culture altogether, which also sometimes um, is sort of a sort of argument against uh, the representation of queerness right now, because uh, regressive forces uh, and uh, by God people say, uh, we, didn't have, we, we didn't have queerness in games uh, before, why is it important now? This is a new development um, that's wrong. Claims that video games are inherently straight and white and male and that queerness and people of color and women and so on are rather new phenomenon is obviously uh, a misconception. And the crucial difference here is where we have to um, really um, pay attention is that it's we talk if we talk about mainstream or big budget or about um, independent and uh, self-released games, um, there's a big uh, difference in where queerness is represented and where it isn't or hasn't. Uh, but before we can examine authentic queer representation in video game history, um, we need to talk about what what is authentic, what is authenticity and what is queerness. I will only touch on those things very briefly because there, this, it's, it's an, at least one, if not two um, talks in itself and we can put, discuss these two words like for hours. So I will only give you a small baseline for it because it's worthwhile for um, the discussion afterwards and my method of uh, scrutinizing if uh, a, queer, a queer representation is authentic or not. Um, so authenticity has been an important aspect for many video games over the last three decades, at least, with um, the introduction of uh, 3D graphics at the latest, although it was called by a different name for a long time, and that name is realism. A game was called realistic uh, when it represented the world and the objects in it uh, as authentic as possible. Uh, whether it's the exact imitation of a soccer player's movements, 
the handling of an aircraft um, or the faithful reproduction of historical cities, the more real a game real uh, a gaming experience felt for the players, the higher it was praised for a long time. Up until now, a valid method to determine how real or authentic a video game appears is its ability to portray water in lakes, for example, uh, or rivers and oceans smoothly and um, um, like watery and wavy. This stems from the invention and blazing fast technology advancement of the 3D graphics. Alongside grew the obsession with realism or authenticity of uh, on an object focused level, like the discussion about realism for a long time was almost exclusively one about objects and inanimate elements and practically never about characters, stories or behaviors. So um, a shooter was deemed realistic if the weapons in the game were like real life weapons and looked like real life weapons. Um, or if we go to a certain area and there are um, the, the buildings are um, exactly like the buildings. If, if a game for example, takes place in Venice, um, the, the game tried to um, make the game sphere look like Venice uh, by copying um, the texture of the buildings and stuff. Um, but ideas of authenticity and realism are socially conditioned. They are contingent constructs that are generated communicatively. So um, authenticity is not something that you can just uh, add into a, a space like a video game by putting an object there and then the whole thing is authentic, but uh, with interaction between people because our world is built like that. Um, and those worlds and those uh, cultural um, contingent contracts and all, all those uh, socially contingent uh, conditions uh, spheres um, are negotiated within the framework of power relations. And that is also something that can only happen in video games with characters, with stories. If you only go to a lifeless Venice, that's not the real authentic Venice because in Venice people live actually there and go to work there and they have a political system. S uh, and only if you also build that into a game then it's more authentic. So um, for example, people saying, keep politics out of my games, um, neglect the um, thought that if we kept any, any uh, politics out of the game, it's A, politics in itself, and B, uh, it's not authentic or real anymore. Um, this suggests that authenticity is inseparably linked to a sort of creative act, a staging, and that of course connects to the approach of performance. And performance is, also one way to look at gender. Uh, Keith Harvey argues that authentic is something naturally occurring. So um, Keith uh, Harvey says um, it's authentic if something happens uh, or something is done without the awareness of the act of observation on the part of the speakers. So um, if someone just do, does something like, I don't know, uh, does a dance, for example, this dance is only authentic if no one is watching um, and the person who does the dance sees a person watching, if they just do it for themselves without notify, noticing that someone else is watching, then that it's then that's authentic uh, in the eyes of Harvey. So uh, the depiction of that authenticity are representations. Um, that of course means that um, this naturally occurring authenticity is something that comes from the inside of the people itself. Um, and if that's the case, queer authenticity in games um, might not even be possible because we always watch things happen. Like as a player, we come like, for example, with our avatar, we go to a, to a in-game to a, like small village and we watch the other villages do something. Um, it's uh, immediately not authentic anymore because they see us do something. And of course, uh, the programmers programmed uh, and the designers designed that interaction, like if we watch, um, I don't know, a tribe, tribal dance or something, they put that in there so it might, might be seen. So it can't be authentic anymore in the thinking of Harvey. But from a certain point of view, it's still possible because if we take into account the position of the creator or the creators, in, in this case, in, my, in the case of my example, the creators of the uh, the, the dance, the creation cannot be separated from the creator itself. Um, so um, if someone does this dance, 
uh, they uh, themselves came up with, or their, uh, if, if their ancestors came up with it, or it's part of a tradition, um, that can also be authentic because it's connected to this person uh, as a creator of the dance. And if we connect those dots uh, or lines to the queerness, queer creators infuse the work with authentic queerness. So if people who are queer create a game, there's uh, an uh, amount of authentic queerness in the game already. Um, that's another way to look at it. That this would be like con combining Harvey with uh, a modern approach of the creation uh, um, and creator connection. Um, of course, if we talk about gender and queerness, um, we have to follow um, people like Judith Butler, Simone de Beauvoir, and others who see gender as a performance, which linked back to the thing that I said earlier that um, it's an act. Authentic uh, uh, acts always are a way of performance. And if gender is a performance, um, and gender performance is the idea that gender is something inscribed in daily practices, learned and performed based on cultural norms of femininity, masculinity, and beyond and in between, then gender is a spectrum. And um, gender is not something naturally biologically given, maybe, uh, at least in the eyes of Butler and de Beauvoir and some others, but it's acted, becomes naturalized over time. So we've learned our, how to perform a gender. Uh, we act and walk and talk in ways that consolidate uh, the idea of a man, of a woman, of gender fluidity, of non-binary or gender queer. And gender is seen as a spectrum as, and we consciously or unconsciously place ourselves on that spectrum with ability to adjust our position continuously. So we never stop. We always perform, 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 and that performance can be uh, authentic. But um, if we just limit our um, view of gender to that, that means that no, none of our gender um, norms are uh, actually real and they are all made up, but our society doesn't work like that. So um, it's, it's difficult to um, take that approach and put it on gender and queerness in video games, because we always um, act out stories and characters that others came up with. So it's hard to say that it's um, something that we uh, learned uh, by playing. Um, it's just, um, these approaches, and there are many more, um, suggest that, there's a dis that there could be distinct queer markers that identify a game or its contest as queer. Yet, as we've just learned, these markers are never fixed. So um, if what a woman is up to discussion, then um, a, a, a marker of a woman in a game is also up to discussion and we can't ever put a, a finger on it. So it's always in, in motion. So queerness also is a constant discourse. Queerness in itself is not like A, B or C, but queerness can mean many things in many different times. Queerness in the 1980s meant something different than queerness today. Um, and language and behavior contribute actively to the elaboration of uh, identity and this discussion. Um, so we have some sort of queer markers in our depiction of queerness that have been slowly um, been established over the last couple of years. Um, for example, visual queer identity markers often used are like uh, colors, certain colors, like uh, of course the rainbow, but if we don't have the rainbow on a person, it's like variations of blue, pink, and purple, um, of, uh, often as hair colors, asymmetric hairstyles, like a side cut, an undercut, or very short hair. It's often used in some certain context of games as a marker of uh, a queer persona, or wider cut clothes, hoodies, comfortable trousers, worn by people that are traditionally not um, seen as people who would wear, wear that. that. But that's only on a superficial level. Queer identity markers often used uh, on this stereotypization. Um, and it, that's a dangerous way to pursue as we already all saw in the beginning with the diversity tool. There are also some sort of behavioral markers that make it somewhat clearer if something, someone or something is uh, really queer or authentic queer, um, like uh, going to queer bars or events uh, and engaging in romantic or sexual activities. 
Um, but those behavioral markers can easily always be countered or recontextualized by a player interaction or narration later in the game. So for example, if I go with my avatar into a queer bar, um, I can always um, act the way that I could later on say, oh, that was just an experiment or um, um, uh, the, the, the character I'm playing is still like uh, not queer, cisgender, is hetero. It was just um, because of, I don't know, I had to go there because of a quest or something. I had to perform certain acts like in uh, Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild, uh, we have to dress up uh, Link as a sort of woman to get into a certain area. So um, the discussion if Link is a queer person or queer character uh, has been uh, reignited uh, through that uh, mission. Um, so it's, it's a bit tricky uh, to say that, okay, if you perform a certain uh, act or behave a certain way as a character in a game, then this character has to be queer. Um, one of the um, less amb ambiguous ways is, uh, of course, self-identification by the characters through speech or text, which means if you encounter a certain character, let's say you are in uh, Fallout and you go to a character and talk to them, and they just, uh, in, in the conversation, the topic comes up that they say, oh, by the way, I'm a lesbian or something. Um, this is, of course, uh, um, bit less ambiguous, but still uh, we can't know if uh, the person is lying or if uh, there's a deeper meaning behind it. Um, so the ambiguity of many markers uh, uh, and lack of clear statements leads to the invisibility of queerness um, as the assumed norm is still cisgender heteronormative. So um, the whole world is cisgender heteronormative unless proven otherwise. And that's uh, a problem in itself. So um, if uh, how, why do I have to announce myself as a queer character um, um, to prove that, it, that queerness exists in a game? Um, and that has been the case for a long time. Um, so the lack of queer depiction, as well as the stereotypical depiction of queerness in games, has real life consequences. Um, because people who play it might uh, see this or get, have this as their first and only contact to queerness in their everyday life. And if that's the only source they get, um, that's, the, that's the source material and the knowledge that they might, not, they don't have to, but they might use that knowledge uh, for the real life experience. Uh, so designing Solili for a wrongly assumed idealized gamer um, which is, like I said, the uh, wrongly um, assumed idealist gamer is white, cis, male, um, replicates society's imbalanced power structures uh, of our so-called real life, the fleshy life we live in and sweat in right now. Um, this penalizes players who do not match the stereotype um, or characters. Um, so for people who design games or come up with games or do uh, work in a creative space in game uh, in the games industry, uh, their design choices must be ma made very, very consciously um, and with an awareness of their disparate effects on different groups of players. So if, if uh, you create a game, always think about your uh, target group as a diverse target group and not only one perfect player. Um, putting these things together that I just talked about, um, I came up with these three uh, like baselines to dis discern if um, queerness in a game is authentic or not. A, there has to be speech or behavioral acts that clearly enunciate queerness. B, these acts must be meaningful or have an impact in the game world or distinctly mirror real life experiences or events. Um, because if we only have A, then that's basically more or less the diversity tool we saw in the beginning, because then it's just there and it doesn't have any um, impact on the world, the story or the game. Um, and then that's, that's not a useful form of representation.
Uh, we will come to that in a minute um, when I talk about um, representation throughout the history. Um, so these acts must be meaningful or have an impact in the game world. Uh, or C, distinctly mirror real life experience or events, which, which also brings back uh, the authenticity thing, which means like if a game is about, uh, for example, the Stonewall riots or the AIDS crisis, then that is a real life event that in itself has authentic queerness um, as, a, as an impact on our world. And if we, and if a game incorporates that, then that's also um, authentic representation. Um, due to the lack of time, I won't get into the topic of queer baiting. It is problematic um, and it's somewhere in between these things, um, but I don't have the time to like um, dissect the whole problem of queer baiting for everyone who does not know who, what queer baiting is. Just in short, it means that um, characters um, are teased as maybe queer, but they never act upon their queerness. So they, uh, like a woman flirts with another wom woman, or um, there are some sort of um, superficial love uh, uh, um, declarations, but it's never acted upon. Um, so it's only in the head or in the interpretation of the players. Um, and that is also problematic in terms of representation because if if it's not there like if it's not um like i said in um a if it's not um enunciated uh, clearly then it can be just uh, blotted out so now i want want to uh, go through the different historical stages i've um i came up with these um like errors um on, not entirely on my own, uh, but um, they are not fixed. And of course there are like uh, overlapping uh, movements and progressions throughout the years. But um, the first one I um, dubbed uh, Queer Streets of Rage, Misrepresentation of Queerness in Games because, because the, uh, the first section of games that I want to talk about and the uh, first historical section is uh, mostly um, uh, portraying people that are queer uh, as negative and harmful um, in mainstream video games. That's always important as it, because it, it's the most visible form of uh, video game content. So we need to talk about uh, hurtful misrepresentations of queerness because it's also for a long time has been the only big representation. And the few queer characters that did exist were often relegated um, to general non-player characters or often relied on tokenism and as a result to mark them as different or to be a joke's pun punchline. Um, although there are numerous instances of this practice, I will only highlight some outstanding, negatively outstanding examples. Uh, for example, uh, this little fella, I don't know if you know him, uh, that's a uh, um, from a game called Dracula Unleashed, 1993. And I start in the 90s because that's when um, na narration and stories uh, became more important and uh, less uh, basic and uh, um, just like to... The games before that had, of course, some sort of story, but um, there was a deep lack of any bigger meaning. It was usually just uh, save the world, save the girl, or just have fun. Um, and this is uh, the first speaking role for a gay character, a queer character, uh, and was featured uh, in this game. It was a full motion video, an FVM, FMV game. Um, and it's called, he, he's called Alfred Horner, Horner, a bit like horny, because he was negatively portrayed as a pervert in the game. Um, it was really, you really hated him when you played the game. Uh, and this is already like uh, problematic to, to be the first speaking role and uh, um, of course or, um, immediately be negative. And the next one, I hope they'll give loads in time. It takes a while. Um, here we go. Uh, this is uh, a boss from uh, Beat'em Up Brawler called Streets of Rage 3, released in 1994 by Sega. Uh, and Ash as a campy muscle man who dances around in a shiny black unitard with a purple biker vest 
leather wrist cuffs and a mid calf boots with spiky heels. So he looks a bit like a mashup of at least two of the village people. And you can see how his movements are. He's standing with like crossed legs somehow, and he, his, his running motion is very, very weird. Um, and the interesting thing is that um, this opponent was only encountered in the Japanese version of the game. Uh, the West Western release swapped him with another boss, Shiva, who was like some sort of uh, ninja, because Ash sexuality and gender performance was not seen as suited for a younger audience at which the game was aimed. Similarly, we have another beat em up game called Vendetta from 1991. Um, the characters uh, look similar. They are half-naked male enemies in leather clothing attacking the player, but they're not just beating the player. Uh, they're attacking him with sexually charged movements like dry humping. Um, and during the fight, uh, they also hump, uh, for example, a light pole until the bulbs fall down on their heads and knocking them uh, down. They are thus at once threatening using sexual assault uh, um, against uh, the player as a weapon, you can clearly see it in this game that uh, our player character is not happy. And of course, it's uh, it's a sexual violence. But also they're uh, portrayed as comically uh, inept as their uncontrolled sexual desire leads them to hurt themselves. Um, what makes these examples particularly despicable is the fact that the core mechanic of the game and thus the player's task is to beat them up brutally. So allowing the players to engage in physical violence against clearly queer coded characters, uh, which can foster and fix anti-queer tendencies and mindsets in players that are already there. So they can, can for example, just act out their uh, violent fantasies against gay men, which is highly problematic. A bit more cynical is another brawler called Final Fight. I don't have a picture right now. Uh, but you can easily look it up on uh, the web. Um, there is a character called Poison or Roxy, uh, and it first appeared in the original installment of the series. Uh, series and uh, it was originally conceived as a female thug. Um, so it was a female uh, enemy that you had to beat up. But uh, concerns during the game's development about reactions from North American audiences to fighting and beating up woman, women led to the character being reimagined as a transgender woman. And suddenly, for the developers, it was okay. Um, this bears the harmful and, uh, uh, understanding that transgender women are somehow A, still men, because they are not real women, and thus the use of, B, the use of violence against them is legitimate. Um, this is very worrying and harrowing, um, seeing transgender women, women face extraordinary levels of violence year after year for decades now. Uh, the the uh, cases of uh, violence against uh, trans, trans women in, in particular has skyrocketed in the last years more and more. And uh, we even have uh, a, an annual uh, trans day of remembrance for all the trans women that have been murdered. Uh, so having this kind of uh, uh, information about a character explicitly changed to a trans woman to, uh, to make it okay to beat up is highly problematic. We also have uh, other genres that have problematic depictions um, around that time, not only brawler games, but also role play games like Gothic. Um, there's a character, Mutt, who is highly gay coded. Um, and when encountered by the player's male avatar, he follows uh, you around, continually asking annoying questions and making an insinuation of wanting to have sexual intercourse with the player. And this is already kind of problematic, but the next bit is uh, the, the real problem, because the only way for players to get rid of mud is by either having him die uh, uh, by getting killed by other characters or monsters, or kill him yourself. Uh, so uh, another way um, of depicting violence against uh, queer people as something that is needed or okay. These narrative and gameplay mechanics have been used to normalize straight relationships while othering or demonizing queer ones. 
For a long time, even those rare games that included opportunities for players to pursue queer romance or sex options quarantined that content, requiring players to make a series of specific choices to access it, access it even as those uh, uh, same games. So, um, for example, Star Wars The Old Republic from 2011 um, strictly limited characters to relationship with opposite gendered characters at its point of release. Two years later, after release, with the rise of the Hot Cartel expansion, the creators announced that this would change, uh, but same-sex character relation partners would be limited to a certain computer-controlled uh, characters on one single in-game planet. Um, so relegating queerness to one small corner of the massive game universe comes off as a separate but equal half-measure treatment of the issue uh, that might actually be worse than having no queerness at all in the game it is a major flaw in game design. Don't relegate queerness to like this, like, like this uh, one section, like this, which, which is like dangerous, or um, you can close it off and don't go to the queer planet uh, kind of problem. Generally speaking, video games inherited those tropes from movies a lot, including a tendency to equate being gay or trans or queer in general with being evil. Uh, just a few of those depictions or uh, uh, tropes include flamboyant demon lord, sadistic butch, butch lesbian, and murderous trans women characters. In such games, heterosexuality and gender conformity are aligned with heroism, uh, virtue, while homosexuality and queerness and gender nonconformity aligned with chaos, instability, and destruction. One big example is um, the Metal Gear series, Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3 in particular, with uh, the characters Vamp and Colonel Volgen. Vamp, Vamp is uh, a boss in the second game, which is who is not only somehow nearly immortal, but also kind of drinks blood and is uh, depicted as bisexual, which doesn't make any big sense in this spy, spy thriller game. Um, and um, is, of course, highly problematic in its uh, abducting the, the child sister of your uh, buddy, uh, Otacon, in the game um, and must be killed. And Colonel Volgen is the main antagonist in Metal Gear Solid 3, and he has is depicted as having a, a same-sex relationship with another um, officer, uh, Rykov. And the game does not only show this, but there's a mission where you have to infiltrate a base, knock Rykov unconscious, uh, dress up as him, and put on a mask that looks like him and uh, thus try to fool Volgin in releasing a prisoner. But Volgin, um, <laughs> he realizes this ruse by grabbing the player's uh, balls and expecting them with your ha the, his hands and realizing those are not the balls of my lover, so you have to be an imposter. Uh, so this is a very weird depiction of uh, uh, vilifying queerness. Um, and of course, he's the main villain, uh, a pseudo fascist kind of military dictator, power crazy, uh, and you have to kill him in the end. The second stage of uh, queer history or queer authenticity in games, uh, I've called Never Not There, the early years of queer games, which takes place roughly at the same time as the first uh, era. But the difference is, um, it's mostly happening on the indie sector. Um, it's hard to really retrace these beginnings because queer culture of remember remembrance has been largely neglected, neglect neglected, deemed unworthy, or even was outright erased by mainstream society for decades, uh, maybe centuries, and much has been lost. Mm. Just as queer history in general, just remember um, how Nazis uh, burned the whole um, Hirschfeld uh, uh, library, which contained a lot of research and documents and queer artifacts uh, of uh, hundreds of years before. On the other hand, it makes it also incredibly, incredibly hard to retrace the beginnings because it bears the danger of the illusion that there is some sort, one historical truth 
by um, ex um, accessing um, few arch archival materials we do have. So by by saying, okay, we found these three games, so that those must be uh, the only ones, or those must be the definitive ones. Um, adding to the fact that some characters, uh, genders and sexualities and stories were revealed only long after they were initially introduced by the uh, creators, developers, or um, the companies, um, that further complicates the issues. So, issue. so it's neither possible or really useful to try to find the first queer uh, video game in history. So uh, just to say that before we go into the uh, games that I, I want to show you, because um, I don't want to be under mis misunderstood that these are the first ones. It's just some of those we still have um, and some of the early is one that are still known and accessible. Um, also, it's a problem uh, that has more layers than just this one because it's, uh, queer video games have been largely ignored by mainstream press, um, as games in, in general, because games are not a serious issue. So and, uh, like press, like uh, uh, big newspapers or TV or like networks uh, are not in, have, have not been interested in games in general. The uh, games industry was not very interested in queer games because indie games were not important to them to make money. And the queer community themselves deemed games as often as not part of queer culture uh, because it was very new in the uh, 80s and uh, early 90s. So it was really this kind of combination that made queer video games very, very, very niche and uh, now very hard to find. One of the biggest uh, uh, still available because it was uh, luckily uh, restored after a disc was found is this one. Caper and the Castro from 1989 by CM Ralph. Uh, and it's a sort of, I don't know, I would say, say it's a noir detective story. It's a point and click adventure. Um, and uh, players take on the role of a lesbian detective, Trekker McDyke, searching for her transgender drag queen friend, Tessie Lafemme, who has gone missing from the Castro neighborhood, uh, district of San Francisco. The queer community was very grateful for this game. And after being thought lost, it was luckily restored recently. Um, on an abstract level, the game, game deals with contemporary politics um, um, and violence against queer people. This is how the game looks like. This is an actually in-game screenshot. So you have these black and white rooms and you have like this inventory on the right and a small map and you can turn around in a room and click on certain items and interact with them. The game uh, was created by a queer person, uh, CM Ralph. It features a playably, playable openly queer protagonist searching for a queer friend, takes place in various queer coded locations from, the, from real life San Francisco and constantly references queer culture. Uh, all these uh, aspects makes the game from my point of view uh, and its characters authentically queer. Because if you remember what I said, A, um, it has to be enunciated, which it does. And B, there have to be uh, useful and impactful interactions in the story, or um, there have to be real life uh, events that take place in the game. And this game does all three. Um, by putting the player into the, this first person ego perspective, it tries to achieve a highly immersive effect for the player at that time, because we're ta talking 89. So um, graphics were still a bit um, tricky. And uh, this is an indie game that, uh, developed by only one person, though it was really hard. Uh, back then, there weren't many tools to come out, create games. Um, so this was, at that time, deemed very uh, immersive. And uh, by this immersive effect, uh, we learned um, that this could, be, uh, a, a, a could create a strong connection for queer players um, to their own experiences in life. So they can see themselves represented. And people who are not queer, who play this, can also learn one or two things about it, even though it was very much uh, with a lighthearted, almost uh, comedic uh, tone. It was still with um, with the topics and the, and the story very serious because the game 
um, takes also a strong stand on morality as being gay in the 1980s was often regarded as something indecent and immoral by mainstream society. Uh, but portraying all queer people uh, in this game with moral integrity, while the villain in the, in, in, in the game is a criminal, unethical, straight man. Uh, I don't want to spoil you. You can still try to play it. I think it's available on the internet. Um, who that villain is, but it comes becomes queer quite soon. Um, but this sends um, a, a really queer, a clear message: um, who is really um, moral and who is immoral. This way, Sim Ralph also queers distorts and distorts the narrative experience of most other games of the time, in which the cisgender straight white man is usually the hero of the story. Another game from that time uh, is Gay Blade from 1992 by Ryan Best. It's a role-playing game um, and takes players into an Asian, ancient and dark dungeon on a quest to rescue uh, Empress Nelda from a white right-wing cre uh, creature inhabiting, right-wing creatures inhabiting this dungeon. Um, the playable rescue party uh, consists entirely of various queer characters and is indicated in the game manual. Enemies in the game include hate-spreading TV evangelists, uh, young Republicans, rednecks, and anti-gay anti -gay cops, as well as so some uh, of sexually transmitted infection. And this is how the go game looked like. Games, it highly reminds uh, us uh, on games like Doom. And you can see like on the right, we have the uh, queer characters. Um, um, highlighted is the dwarf Leanne, who is queer uh, with their uh, attacks. Um, Brian Best himself described making the game as a therapy, putting every time of type of person that had bullied him or his friends into the game as a monster you had to destroy. According to Best, it relieved him from a lot of emotional baggage. The game sold thousands of copies. There was a lot of press coverage for Gay Blade, particularly in terms of being an indie queer game in 1992 by uh, the likes of USA Today, German publication Der Spiegel, National Public Radio and uh, LGBTQ newspapers from all around the world. So another case of queer, uh, authentic queer representation right there, done by a queer person, features queer uh, characters and has some real life, life topics. Moving on to the postmodern puberty stage of queer representation, queer games around the new millennium. Towards the turn of the millennium, queer characters were still quite rare in games, but the ones that did exist were less and less the punchline of jokes or portrayed only negatively. Uh, with the increasing spread of internet access and connection speed came the emergence of online communities, many of which revolved around games. So also queer communities uh, increased drastically and people connected all over the world. Unsurprisingly, queer gamers were part of that and started to form their own online groups and forums, message boards, often opening safe spaces for queer people. These groups then took hold in online games like queer only or queer friendly guilds and popular massively multiplayer online role play games like uh, World of Warcraft or um, uh, others. Also around that time, the Sims came out, which also is very uh, popular among, uh, among queer people because it's uh, very early uh, was possible to um, have queer couples and uh, all forms of sexuality in there. And ever since uh, the Sims developers have um, infused every instance of the game with more and more queer options. So the demographic started to shift slowly, uh, about very slowly uh, by 2006. For queer characters, it was often a stepping back and forth concerning mainstream games by occupying the same marginalized space as the previous two decades. Many references were still based on offhanded comments. There were still joke references and hinting fairly overly to a character sexuality or gender was uh, more or less uh, the best you could get. And it was uh, rarely like stated outright. Um, and also there were no queer stories or topics in mainstream games yet. Uh, queer characters were mostly visible as villains as for example, uh, Far Cry 4, Assassin's Creed. Uh, I, I told you about Metal Gear Solid, Three Snake Eater and Bioshock Infinite. 
Um, the casting of uh, the only queer characters as willing is villains is the problem here, as well uh, as well as stereotyping uh, of a certain camp gay character, says as such as Mokoto from Enchanted Arms or Yan and Dallas in Valkyria Chronicles. That conveys the subtext that queerness is inherently putrid and morally wrong. Um, but we have some first positive representations in mainstream games. Um, being minor characters. Um, also, many depictions of queerness were only dependent on decisions of players. So um, if I, for example, in a role play game, um, decide that my character is queer, then there's queerness in the, games, if, in the game. If I don't, then there's not. And queerness only visible by choice is not really representation. So it lacked authentic queer representation um, a lot. One example I want to uh, talk about is uh, Star Wars again, Knights of the Old Republic. Uh, it's one of the sort of noteworthy exceptions, but still with problematic content. Uh, but it would allow players to romance a lesbian Jedi Knight by the name of Juhani. Um, while it's not the first game to allow the player the option of same-sex romance, uh, it, was a it was the first really big blockbuster game that went on to win a number of awards. Uh, Knights of the Old Republic turned out to be one of the prophetic frontrunners of how the act of queerness would usually be incorporated into mainstream role-playing games until now as a choice. Similarly, we have games like uh, Jade Empire, which uh, also uh, was one of the first uh, games that portrayed queerness as something positive. We had, of course, Mass Effect as a big game, cha game changer. Um, and games like Borderlands. As good as this was in terms of respectful visibility and normalizing positive queer content, the authenticity of the queerness is rather questionable because often the queerness in these games is only visible, as I said, when pursued by the player and serve, serves the sole purpose to fulfill the player's romantic or sexual, sexual wishes. The notion or term of player sexuality um, comes into play here. That means that all the characters that have a sexuality are always uh, seem always be too attracted to the main character. Um, Bioware, um, the developers behind uh, games like Mass Effect or um, Dragon Age, um, switch that up a bit in the later games, but usually that's one of those um, in that time around that was still the case. So while these representations might partly meet specification A um, of clearly enunciating queerness of some NPCs, um, they largely fail at B and C when it comes to uh, having meaningful uh, impact on the story or the world. So being reduced to a kind of quest or prize without substantial consequences. Uh, most games in the arts that took queer relationships seriously were again from the indie game scene. Many of these were, for example, visual novels and interactive fiction games like Ab Abigail, Fatal Hearts, uh, A Smashing Gay Out, or A Smashing Day Out, or Don't Take It Personally, Babe, It ain't, Just Ain't Your Story by Christine Love, which uh, explored, for example, explored privacy in the digital age with two gay relationships between a set of male and female couple, couples, while the player character interacts with them as their school teacher. So the sexuality and gender was fixed and you could only interact with them. Uh, so both specification A and B of authentic representation are met here. Also, games were not quite there yet at that time around the 2000s. Uh, there was a lightly euphoric mood, especially in the indie game sector. Popular game magazine, The es es Escapist, even dedicated a special issue uh, to queerness in games called Queer Eye for the Gamer Guy in 2009. But mainstream industry games, AAA productions still were stuck in adolescence without room for queer main characters on a greater scale. Um, let's talk about coming of age and gender, queer games in the 2010s and beyond. So coming up to our presence, more or less. Um, and games focusing more on personal experience started to emerge 
um, and they were, uh, were talking about emotions and explorations of gender and sexuality explicitly, releasing around the beginning of the 2010 decade, um, led by many uh, to proclaim a uh, um, queer games movement. Uh, mostly those games were autobiographically uh, like uh, puzzle game Dysphoria by Anna Enthropy. You can see it here. I hope the GIF loads in a second, which uh, depicts um, on a very basic level. I think it's done in Bitsy, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the um, everyday life of a trans person. So um, here we can see the, uh, the, the, the person is just standing there. And then there is like, can I help you, sir? and you uh, click a button and you yell ma'am at them. On uh, one of the other mini games in, the, uh, in this in this foria are that your nipples are very sensitive from taking um, uh, estrogen. So you have to um, avoid the spikes, um, which should uh, re resemble um, um, like bodily functions and changes. Or um, here it's, it talks about um, getting medicine and treatment. Um, where you have to like uh, track uh, the medicine coming from uh, the sky and you have to catch up in your mouth uh, while having a text that says, I can prescribe you estrogens until you get your blood pressure down, which uh, of course is hard if you're constantly discriminated against. Other examples are Minichi, uh, which is a small uh, RPG that takes te place in this restaurant. Uh, which also just um, is sort of a slice of life uh, story where you can see a, a scene here at the GIF uh, where someone orders a, co a coffee and uh, the waiter uh, um, uh, and you say you, there's a like, slight confusion if uh, the person um, uh, is a man, a woman or something else. Also Lim is a, a, a queer game. Um, done by a, a single person which deals with um, discrimination and mobbing and bullying on a very abstract level. And of course, something like the coming out simulator is also uh, one of the games that um, clearly enunciate this and try to um, um, show how this act of coming out is uh, very, very um, difficult sometimes. It's an interactive fiction game about a teen coming out to his mother as bisexual and the mother is not taking it very well. Um, of course, Gone Home in 2013 is a major turning point in some ways for queer representation in games. Um, it was widely um, recognized. And so on the one hand, it at that time, it was the most complete and emotionally comprehensible uh, coming out story uh, that can be explored interactively in that point of time. But on the other hand, the problem with it is that it's still an act of voyeurism by a heterosexual avatar. We play a heterosexual non-queer person uh, and queerness is some, somehow also uh, the spectacle and mystery to be revealed because uh, we come into the, the like the living space of a of, of of a person and by snooping around and discovering journals and, and tapes and stuff we um, find out uh, passively more uh, so to speak that this person is queer um, so it's not like this own voice uh, agency thing but we um, it's more like this mystery um, so it has this double-sided sword kind of function um, because it's bridging the gap between indie and mainstream games because it was released by a, a bigger publisher. It uh, reached a wider audience. Um, so it, it, it brought queer games out of the niche into the mass market um, by, and, and putting a queer experience at the center uh, and still targeting a wide audience. Uh, so it's commercial success uh, proved that alternative style uh, games uh, like this point and click narrative game, call it walking sim, whatever, uh, can be successful, deviating from the standards expected in the triple A game world. Um, so these, uh, yeah, sort of indie alternative ways of making games um, can uh, thrive. Um, and a lot of the discussions followed uh, the game's release, not only about the depiction of queerness, but also the mechanics and core features 
features which qualify an interactive experience as a game, was praised as well as criticized from both mainstream media and the queer community. Uh, Overwatch was also uh, firstly relieved, uh, released in the game, and here we come back to the beginning. Um, how it did, it did not automatically lead to more positive queer representation in mainstream games, it's definitely not authentic, um, but um, it, it was done by uh, one of the biggest companies and featured a wide variety of uh, characters um, and uh, the companies uh, uh, up until the point were very reluctant uh, to incorporate queer characters because they feared the backlash of conservative reaction effections of the customers, um, which led to an sort of outsourcing of queerness into this thing called paratext, which is here um, in Overwatch, like these little um, uh, animation films that are released on YouTube, but that never featured in the game or uh, comic stories um, that show that people are queer, uh, but also are never talked about in the game because Overwatch doesn't have a sort of story. So it's not really authentic queer uh, representation uh, in the original game. Uh, we will see how Overwatch 2 will maybe change that. Um, one positive or one example that is a bit more positive but still problematic um, is uh, Fallout New Vegas in 2010, the character of uh, Veronica Santangelo, um, a scribe from the in-game faction Brotherhood of Steel. She is in love with a fellow scribe, Christine Royce. However, Christine's homophobic parents force her, her Veronica, to leave the Brotherhood. Uh, and um, no, force not Veronica, but uh, Christine, sorry. Uh, the parents force her, their own daughter, to leave because they are homophobic and Veronica was unable to conv convince her to stay and could not bring herself to abandon the order. So she was torn about uh, between her love life and her uh, uh, sort of found family. Uh, and this story also is uh, the so-called tragic lesbian or tragic queer trope, uh, which is largely criticized for conveying the message that queer love might exist but always and strategically, and you have to choose, and consequently uh, should be avoided. Um, at the same time, St. Angelo's story shows that the narrow-minded anti-queer attitude of the Brotherhood of Steel's faction, which symbolizes groups like religious communities with anti-queer convictions and beliefs, uh, is, is uh, uh, an issue that has to be tackled. So it brings this kind of real life topic to, to the, uh, um, uh, to, to the awareness of the players. Whereas the insinuation of real life discrimination could add to the queer authenticity of the character because it's uh, like, this is uh, part C of my three uh, um, uh, uh, markers. The utilization of the tragic queer trope and lack of palpable impact of it for the player in the world and the interaction with Veronica rather disqualifies it. One example that does it a lot of better is uh, to the character of Chromesius, also called Krem, a classy in Dragon Age uh, 2000, 2009 to 2015. It's Dragon's Age Inquisition in this case. Uh, it's a much more promising example of queer representation because uh, he's a transgender man. His backstory is complex, um, interweaving his queer identity with the financial struggle of his family. At the point in time when the player meets Krem, he's a lieutenant in a mercenary group led by the Iron Bull. After a couple of successful quests, so not right away, which is also important, the player can find out more about Krem, uh, Krem's past via dialogue. And it depends how you ask these questions, how much information you get. Um, the Iron Bull acceptance depicted here on the right, uh, an inclusive attitude towards Krem and transgender people in general makes them a powerful example of an ally to queer people. After the release of the game, Bioware explained via a blog post how the writing team created Krem's character and personal history. By consulting with queer people and getting their feedback, um, they rewrote, rewrote the script so it would not be cliche or hurtful for transgender players. Krem's struggle reflects real life problems that queer people have, such as being financially responsible for their family, having to hide their true identity to practice their job, and answering transgressive questions from other random people. So this could be seen as um, authentic queer representations in my definition. Other notable um, uh, mentions are Dishonored, Death of the Outsider, Outer World, and of course the very recent examples of Tell Me Why and The Last of Us 2. 
So tell me why on The Last of Us 2, uh, um, big budget examples and were really, really, really um, important for queer authentic uh, representation. They're, but they are worthy of their own talks. And I'm, I've running, I'm running out of time here. And I could talk at least one hour about those two. Uh, those two. Let's just quickly say my, my op opinion is that um, the, last of two, the Last of Us 2 um, does well in some as aspects, um, but not the, that well in others. We have this very um, authentic depiction of a lesbian couple and their struggles. But again, we have the tragic trope. I don't want to spoil too much, but it's there. And we have a, a, a transgender character um, whose depiction and narration is also a bit problematic in my uh, opinion. Tell me why on the other hand uh, meets all my three requirements uh, because it's done with uh, the inclusion of trans people uh, and also of course um, uh, indigenous people because it takes place in an indigenous uh, uh, space area. Um, they, um, they added people from the queer community to the writing staff and it, it specifically tells um, the, the story of uh, a trans male character, trans masculine character, and their struggle with um, their identity and their family. Of course, you can also hear uh, um, criticize that it's again a negative uh, story that is told. But um, at the end, I think um, that's, I don't want to spoil too much uh, again, but uh, I think the end is positive enough to make it uh, uh, authentic queer representation. So to come to an end, um, I established a working definition for you to examine games with queer content throughout several eras of video game history and like continuously, like for new games, I think uh, these uh, three requirements can still be uh, useful. While finding that the indie game scene has been creating authentic queer content in games from the early 90s onward, 1990s onward, mainstream and big budget com companies have progressed only slowly from harmful misrepresentation to authentic queer representation up until now. But there is a tendency, in my opinion, in both indie and big budget game production to aim for more authentic queer representation in games. Um, as queerness claims more space in other media formats uh, than games and in society in general. And I want to leave you with one final quote because I think that's really interesting. And it's um, queer thinking has the potential to simultaneously destabilize and reimagine video games themselves. Rather than understanding games as rule based structures, ludology, or just in terms of representation, narratology, we can view games as spaces where we play within and against rules and explore representation beyond explicitly named queer content. Um, and Barbara Manel said that. So if we want to take this queer authentic um, kind of um, examination even further than the three um, requirements that I uh, came up with, um, we, I think it's even more, more worthwhile. Um, if you want to read more about this, um, my essay is in this book, History and Games, Continuities of an Authentic Park, Past, uh, edited by Martin Lorber and Felix Zimmermann. Um, it uh, was published by Transcript in October 2020. It was published before Tell Me Why and uh, Last of Us 2 came out, so those games are not in there, uh, but it's still I still highly recommend it, not because of my, but because of all the um, articles, essays, and uh, uh, research that's in there. Thank you so much uh, for your attention. And I'm uh, happy for to, uh, to try to ask uh, answer any questions you might have or like discuss uh, some points of my presentations with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lara. Um, for everyone who is not joining the discussion next, um, if you are out there want to read more from Lara, I think um, uh, aside from the book, I can only uh, uh, also recommend visiting her magazine blog, uh, Poly is it pronounced Polygamia? De? Yes. Yes. Um, maybe there's also an article about uh, Last of Us 2. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure. And um, yeah, if you'd like to keep in touch with us at Game City and maybe be part of our, the next Impulse event, you can visit gamecityhamburg.de and subscribe to our newsletter or our Discord community to keep in touch.